You know what time it is. It's that wonderful time of the year when all the YouTubers get together to talk about a scene they love. We've done marvelous scenes, we've done excellent scenes, and we've done villainous scenes. But this year, we're gonna do something a little different. Instead of scenes defined by a set of characters or a specific archetype, we're gonna be looking at something different. Something that almost all scenes have in common. Music. This is one musical scene. We're each going to be looking at a scene that uses music in an interesting way. We'll look at either the lyrics, or the melody, or the context in which the song was written. We'll look at whether the music is the soundtrack, or the score, whether it is diegetic, or whatever the opposite of diegetic is. And when you're done watching this video, go find the rest of the videos on this playlist. They all start with the title, One Musical Scene. And if you feel so inspired, make your own video about a scene that you believe uses music in an interesting way. And then. Title that video, One Musical Scene, dash whatever the title is, and send that to me, twitter.com slash nandoviemovies or nandoviemovies at gmail.com, and then I will put your video on the playlist. So, that's the plan. For my video, I chose a subject that will surprise no one. But, if you've seen the movie and you think you know where I'm going with this, stick around, because I'm about to tell you the story of one of the most chaotic bands in history. The 2016's Suicide Squad was infamous for its needle drops. I mean, it was infamous for a lot of things, but that was one of them. Obvious, heavy-handed song choices that could be assembled by running a random word in every scene through lyric genius. Dan Olson did a great video on how this movie is a mess. Go watch that. Later, obviously. And luckily, James Gunn did not abandon this tradition in 2021's THE Suicide Squad. Like many James Gunn projects, the Suicide Squad is lousy with needle drops. Louis Prima's I Ain't Got Nobody, as Harley escapes from her torturers, is not only a fun lyrical statement, but also an upbeat compliment to Harley's flowery bloodbath. The Jim Carroll band's People Who Died, as both a tone-setting punk rock reintroduction to the Suicide Squad series, and also a confirmation that yes, all those people died. But one stood out to me as odd. As the squad, finally reassembled, prepares for their assault on Jotunheim, the Pixies' hey fades in from the background. Then, at this big triumphant moment when friends like Rick and Harley share one last smile and the team finally seems to be working together, having undergone some bonding and learned about each other, we hit a chorus that just screams, we're chained, over and over and over again until the violence starts. And as I'm thinking about the song, I'm reminded this is not the first time a triumphant character showcase in a superhero movie is paired with the song about how the singers are stuck together. In fact, it's not even the first James Gunn movie where those moments are centered around the word chain specifically. The first was 2017's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, in which Peter summons the power to fight his dad as Fleetwood Max The Chain takes over the soundtrack. So why these two songs at these two moments? Why do so many James Gunn movies have songs about chains? At the climax of Guardians 2, the team has come up with a plan to kill Ego. Everyone stands together for the trailer, and then, as things seem to be coming together, Ego reforms himself in a new Kurt Russell body and takes control of the situation. He knocks the helmet off Star-Lord and catches him in his tendrils. Ego ensnares Gamora and Nebula, pulls the new ship down onto Earth and leaves Drax covered in sand. He traps Groot and Rocket, and Ego breaks Yondu's arrow before he covers Yondu in rocks. And Ego gives this big speech about purpose as we see the expansion of Ego's blue goo across the galaxy. And not to nitpick, not unlike my podcast, mostly nitpicking, subscribe. This is, next to the snap, the most significant thing that has ever happened in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Flowers on every planet, usually near some sort of metropolitan area, transformed into blobs that bulldozed everything in sight. People crushed, buildings toppled. It seems like every planet lost one city at the same time. And I feel like most of them probably never found out why. But Ego's diatribe about Peter focuses on how Peter is throwing away his chance to do something meaningful. Peter Quill was born with a grand cosmic destiny that he is ignoring. For what? A team of misfits? All of humanity? This is clearly his purpose. What greater meaning could life possibly have? And before this point in the story, Peter's connection to the rest of the Guardians is strained. He and Rocket had an argument over who should fly the Milano. 
that ended with the ship destroyed and the team split in two. And this is where we first hear the chain, as Peter, Gamora, and Drax walk away from Rocket. Then, Peter and Gamora's relationship, which I'm still not exactly sure what it even is, has been aggravated by the introduction of Ego, who Gamora never seemed to trust. Possibly because of really good instincts, or possibly because she has not seen a father figure worth trusting since her childhood. Ego asks, what is Peter losing by answering this call? Only things he has already lost. And Peter does not really even have a choice at this point. Sure, Ego is going off on Peter, but by this point he's already got Peter trapped in his tendrils and is using him as a battery to power the expansion. Then Yondu throws in that super on the nose line about how he doesn't fly the arrow with his head but with his and then he gets covered up in rocks before he can say that last part. Although. How funny would it be if he was going to say he flies the arrow with the big fin on his head and whistling? Like, Yandu just wanted to make sure Peter knew that about the arrow since Yandu thought it was cool. No timely revelation or anything, just like arrow facts. And Peter thinks about all the good times he had with his family, listening to music with his mom, getting a pat from Drax, flying with Rocket, almost kissing Gamora, and being taught to shoot by Yandu. Then with this newfound inspiration, Peter summons all of his half-celestial power and charges Ego. And this is when the music kicks in. Then all the Guardians are freed, they defeat Ego, the day is saved. When asked in a Rolling Stone article why he chose this song in the Awesome Mix Volume 2, James Gunn answered, There are two songs that are the most deeply embedded into the fibers of the film. The Chain is one because it is about the Guardians, at least in the way we use it, and we use it a couple times in the movie. And the other one is Brandy, which is an incredibly important song in the movie. Both happen to be two of my favorite songs from the 70s. So that's sort of an explanation, but since this interview came out before the film's release, James Gunn really couldn't say why this song was deeply embedded into the fibers of the film, otherwise he would give plot points away. But to understand why James Gunn chose The Chain, I believe you need to look at the band that created the song, Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac was a band created in the late 1960s by Peter Green, Mick Fleetwood, and Jeremy Spencer. Green and Spencer were guitarists, Fleetwood was a drummer. Soon after they formed, the band would add a bassist named John McVie and a keyboardist named Christine Perfect. And wouldn't you know it, in 1970, McVie and Perfect were married. Foreshadowing. The band was a pretty fluid organization with members coming and going with almost every album. It isn't worth it to name every member, but the ones who were still around in 1972 were Fleetwood, the drummer, McVie, the bassist, and Perfect, now Christine McVie, the keyboardist. Two new faces, Bob Weston and Dave Walker joined in 1972 to fill out the band and they had a bit of success. They were about to go toward the US after one of their songs caught on, but uh oh, one of the new guys slept with Fleetwood's wife and the band broke up. And now, since the band broke up, the tour was canceled, right? You'd assume? This is an aside, it doesn't really have anything to do with the chain, but I think it's too interesting to leave out. The band's manager, Cliff Davis, actually just decided to do the tour anyway. So he hired a different band, told them Fleetwood would show up and tour with them, and called the whole thing the new Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood never came on the tour, which was a disaster, because as fans noted, this was not the band they said it was. It would be like if Green Day broke up before the tour, but they still toured as the new Green Day, but then you get to the concert and it's Huba Stank, or it's whatever more timely references. I don't know that many bands. So those two new guys left, and we were back to this core group, Fleetwood and the McVees. A couple new members cycled in and out, they didn't really stick, but then, in 1975, Fleetwood came across a folk duo named Buckingham Nicks, made up of guitarist Lindsey Buckingham and singer Stevie Nicks. And this is worth mentioning, Lindsay is the boy and Stevie is the girl. It's, a, it's very funny, They one has the girl name, one has the boy name. And when Fleetwood asked Buckingham to join, he said yes, but only as long as Nix could join too. Because A, she's a great singer-songwriter, but also B, the two were dating. So this band was now Mick Fleetwood, who was going through a divorce because a guitarist from three guitarists ago slept with his wife, Christine and John McVie, whose marriage was currently on the rocks, and another couple, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks. And you'll never believe it, but they weren't doing so hot either. This band, at this time, was as chaotic as a band could be. Everyone was breaking up, there was tons of fighting, drinking, an unbelievable amount of drugs. They should not have been together. In an interview with The Guardian, Nicks and McVie said, We were cool on stage, but off stage, everybody was pretty angry. 
Most nights, Chris and I would just go for dinner on our own, downstairs in the hotel, with security at the door. As McVie explained, John and I used to be civil. What key is this in? What do you want me to do on this song? But Stevie and Lindsay were fighting all the time. Very volatile. Their relationship still is an ongoing battle. So it's a disaster. And yet, in 1976, Fleetwood Mac created what is pretty universally regarded as one of the greatest rock and roll records of all time, Rumors. It's full of songs you know whether you realize it or not by way of Forrest Gump, Casino, Our Flag Means Death, I, Tanya, or That Guy Drinking Cranberry Juice. And right in the middle of Rumors is The Chain. The Chain is three things. The Chain is a song defined by its context. It's the ultimate breakup song written by Stevie Nicks about a relationship that has run its course, her relationship with Lindsey Buckingham. Two partners realizing they cannot keep this thing going. If you don't love me now, you will never love me again. Like Rocket and Peter as they part ways. This team is not going to work. Rocket and Peter are both too stubborn to reconcile. Sure, Peter tells Rocket that he's pushing everyone away, but as seen earlier, Peter was pushing Rocket's buttons, so this is on him too. And this tension has split the group in half. The Chain is also a song defined by its passion. Now you would figure, a song like this, breakup song, it's gonna be Stevie Nicks herself, right? Singing about her experience, like Christine McVie's Songbird from the same album. A solo, perhaps with some light backing vocals from other band members. That would be the safe way to do it, the reasonable way. The bonkers way would be to have your then ex-boyfriend sing the song with you. Watch a live performance of The Chain from around when it was released. This one, from 1982, showcases the chaos that was this song. It starts nice, with a simple harmony, listen to the wind blow, that kind of thing. But then, at Damn Your Love, Damn Your Lies, the kick drum drops out and the tone shifts to basically Buckingham and Nick's shouting at each other. If you don't love me now, you will never love me again. But this song is not just about a breakup, it's a betrayal. Both parties are not just saying the other one doesn't love them anymore. The verse ends with the line, I can still hear you saying you would never break the chain. They lied. They said they would never break the chain, and now they're breaking it. This is their fault. And that's why every verse gets angrier, and the tension builds and builds. You said you wouldn't break up. No, you said you wouldn't break up. Back and forth, back and forth, simmering. And then, after the bass comes in and creates a second of calm, Buckingham lashes out with an erratic, indignant guitar solo. And that's the second time the chain shows up in Guardians 2. Ego traps the Guardians and tells Peter how he feels betrayed. You cannot deny the purpose that the universe has bestowed upon you. Why are you destroying our chance? Peter is breaking the chain. The promise he made to Ego in Ego's head that they would take over the galaxy. Ego is justifying to Peter that this is all Peter's fault, and Ego is going to use Peter because Peter forced his hand. And after the Yondu line, Peter thinks about his friends and everything that matters to him, and like the bass line, there's a moment of calm, in the movie it is silence, where Peter uses his heart to unlock his powers and he explodes, wails on Ego, blasts him into a wall. And even though Peter's outburst doesn't time exactly with Buckingham's solo, it's the same energy, pent up anger and resentment at someone who lied to them, used them, and their relationship is over, a full, messy, superhero breakup. But The Chain is also a song made of misfit parts. Like I said, Stevie Nicks wrote the lyrics to The Chain, but the song is way more complicated than that. The bass line and everything that comes after it was from a song written by Fleetwood and John McVie that wasn't really working, but that ending was just so good they couldn't get rid of it. So they threw it at the end of this song. And then they added the kick drum to keep the rhythm in the beginning of the song and use Nix's lyrics here. Then Buckingham and Christine McVie wrote the music for the front and the lyrics for the back half of the song. And then Buckingham threw his guitar solo over the end of the song and they had it. The Chain is the only song on Rumors with a writing credit from each of the members, according to Fleetwood. It was really something that just came out of us playing in the studio. Originally, we had no words for it, and it really only became a song when Stevie wrote some. She walked in one day and said, I've written some words that might be good for that thing you were doing in the studio the other day. So it was put together. Lindsay arranged and made a song out of all the bits and pieces that we were putting down onto tape. 
And then once it was arranged and we knew what we were doing, we went in and recorded it. But it ultimately becomes a band thing anyway, because we all have so much of our own individual style, our own stamp that makes the sound of Fleetwood Mac. So it's not like you feel disconnected from the fact that maybe you haven't written one of the songs because what you do and what you feel when we're all making music together is what Fleetwood Mac ends up being. And that's the stuff you hear on the albums. Whether one likes it or not, this is, after all, a combined effort from different people playing music together. And that's the lyric at the end of the song. Chains keep us together. The song is the chain. Separate pieces from different songs linked, working together and making something new, something strong. And the band is the chain. A bunch of people connected by this single purpose, making music. Band, the music, keeps them together when everything on earth, including each other, is driving them apart. And the guardians are the chain. In this final scene when they're all about to die, no one is alone. Drax is carrying Mantis to Kraglin. Gamora and Nebula are climbing out of the cave together and Rocket, Yondu, and Quill are fighting Ego to protect Groot as he plants the bomb. They are all part of the chain, the team that saves the galaxy. And even though they may not get along, they bicker, insult each other, and just, you know, straight up fight, the galaxy needs them and they need each other. The chain keeps them together. And hey, hey, the song Hey and the Suicide Squad by the Pixies, same deal, real quick, written by a band, the Pixies, that were also on the verge of breaking up. Not quite as interesting as Fleetwood Mac, they got together, recorded some successful albums, including Doolittle in 1989, its 13th track being Hey, and then the band started fighting. The lead singer, Black Francis, seemed to think that the bassist, Kim Deal, was getting a little too popular, so he threw a guitar at her during a concert. That's cool and normal behavior. Deal then refused to perform with the band and eventually left to start her own and Francis eventually announced that the Pixies broke up, which was news to everyone else in the band who apparently found out via fax, which I'm not even gonna try to explain to people under 20, but it's not usually how bands break up. But another chaotic band with a song where they scream about how they are chained. According to the AV Club's Katie Reif, Hey is an earnest expression of tortured longing, exemplified by a wounded, pathetic Francis asking, where have you been? His voice breaking as he cries out, if you go, I will surely die. Another song about a breakup. This one's a little more one-sided than The Chain, but still, a relationship that has met an end. And yet, they are chained. Together. Whether they like it or not. As the Suicide Squad walks into Jodenheim to destroy Project Starfish, everyone but Rick Flagg and I guess Milton are prisoners. They start the movie in chains. And in this shot, they are lined up like a chain gang which if you have not seen Oh Brother Where Art Thou, is where prisoners would be taken out of the prison to do manual labor, and often they were chained at the foot, forced by the prison system to work together. The Suicide Squad is basically a superhero chain gang, and Task Force X is, like The Chain and Fleetwood Mac and the Guardians of the Galaxy, a collection of misfits brought together for a higher purpose. But they form their own chain, relationships developed over the course of the mission, and in Rick and Harley's case, many missions as part of the squad. They look out for each other, drink, laugh, have contests to see who can kill the most guys. When one link is missing, they go to rescue her. And that bond is the real chain that keeps them together when Amanda Waller tells them to let Starro destroy Corto Maltese. Their connection to Rick Flagg and each other strengthens the team so they can disobey Amanda Waller. Why does James Gunn love chains? They are the tension at the center of every one of his movies, and all great stories. Our heroes are chained, kept somewhere they do not want to be, with people they do not want to be with. And yet, these people, and sharks, and raccoon-like aliens, when forced to spend time and grow together, become stronger, linked, forever. The chains keep them together. So that's the scene. Now go watch the other videos on the playlist. And if you are so inspired, make your own. Send it to me, twitter.com slash nandovmovies or nandovmovies at gmail.com and I will put it on the playlist. If you enjoyed this channel, you like the videos I make, and you're thinking about how do you support this channel, 
take a look at my Patreon, patreon.com slash nandovmovies. It really is one of the best ways to support the channel, and you get so much great stuff out of it. The videos are there very early sometimes, except for this one, because it's a surprise. We do a monthly live stream where I talk about whatever it is you guys want me to talk about. It's a lot of fun. We even have a book club. This month we're reading She-Hulk by Dan Slott. If you've ever thought about it, it is one of the best ways to support the channel. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. All of my patrons, you guys are amazing. Thank you to everybody who listens to the podcast, mostly nitpicking. Everybody subscribe to the channel. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. And thank you to everybody who follows me on Twitter, twitter.com slash nandoviemovies, and everybody else who has made videos for this project. They are all really, really cool, and I hope you enjoyed them. That's all I got. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.